the thesis question of today. How can translating game music into an album format be made easier? That's a bit of a mouthful, but I can explain. I'm going to play some music. Close your eyes, and I want you to ask yourself if you know what piece of music this is. That was the Mii Channel theme from the Nintendo Wii. If you were part of the 24% of the United States households in 2011 who owned a Wii, you've probably heard this music at least once. The music was baked directly into the console for free, and it plays when you make a Mii character. Needless to say, the cultural influence of the Mii Channel music was massive. Thousands of TikTok videos feature it. YouTube channels rip the audio from the game and extend it for 10 hours, and those videos have millions of views. But if you wanted to listen to the Mii Channel theme without booting up a Wii, what would you do? Where is game music? Well, the answer for the Mii Channel theme isn't Spotify. And if you're wanting to hear the music in its original quality as written by the composer, that's also not on YouTube. The Mii Channel theme, rendered as intended by the composer, is available on this CD compilation, exclusively released in Japan, titled Touch Generations. Well, oh, okay, I guess I'm a game music nerd and I think it's worth it. So I'll just add it to my shopping cart and... Oh. Officially released game music is not easy to find. And though many people online chalk this up to be the result of some corporate greed or something, the reality is that soundtrack releases can take momentous effort to complete. Each track needs a final mix, and the full soundtrack needs mastering so there aren't harsh differences in quality per track. Just look at the length of the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 soundtrack, which was nominated for the soundtrack of the year during the Game Awards. Think of how many mastering engineers this required, and how they needed pay. And a large portion of the music was recorded live, with a full orchestra. The rights management of a performance and a recording like that, the hours spent mixing, ugh, I can't imagine how much this costs to produce. The point is, there are many difficulties worth considering when releasing game music in an album format. Game music can be very expensive, and more than that, game music is written to be interactive, stopping, layering, and morphing to fit game design and hardware specifications. How can something like that even be translated into a linear album? Well, we arrive back at my thesis question. What could make it easier to turn game music into an album? I propose we break it down into easily digestible sections. Let's define dynamic game music first. Next, let's compare music presentation in-game with official soundtrack releases, so we can see how people have done it before us. We can also consider game music covers as well, because that's another strategy of adapting game music into an album. It's also important to address reasons why composers and companies sometimes choose to not release game soundtracks, and at the end of all this madness, we'll remind ourselves why it's important to make game music easily accessible so we can feel all good about ourselves at the end. Got all that? Well, let's get started with the breakdown. Game music is dynamic music, but what does dynamic music mean? Let's start with everyday music, like your favorite album, or that one song that's occupying the majority of your Spotify raps this year. Each time you play that album, that song, it sounds exactly the same. We'll call music that doesn't change on repeat plays static music. Dynamic music is different. It changes based on input over time. One minute, the song could be a relaxing piano etude, but suddenly, as you press space on your keyboard, it becomes a sick guitar solo. That can happen in games. Game music responds to the player's inputs in a variety of possible ways. Therefore, game music is dynamic. It's possible to categorize behaviors of dynamic music. Samuel Gillespie wrote a dissertation on dynamic music in video games. His work focused on entirely generative composition, so it's not fully relevant. But within that conversation, he suggests four basic categories to describe dynamic music. Category 1 is the immediate behavior. Music with the immediate behavior changes instantly based on player input. An example of this is the Mario Kart Wii menu music, which adds layers as the player completes selections before starting a race. Category 2 is the game state behavior. This behavior reacts to the game's current mode of play. For example, the mainline Pokemon games through Pokemon Sword and Shield have distinct music for adventure and battling. While the player explores the world, a cheery piece of music plays. 
but when they wander into the grass and a monster appears, the game switches to its battle state. During this game state swap, the adventure music pauses and the monster battle music begins. The music here is more exciting and intense to indicate the game's mode of play has changed with a heightened sense of danger. Category 3 is the story behavior. Here, the music that scores a scenario will be replaced by a new music track when the story recontextualizes it. For example, Terrytown in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild starts with a minimalist arrangement of piano, woodwind, and hand percussion. As the player helps various kingdoms with their struggles, people start moving to Terrytown, and the music reflects the instrumentation found within those kingdoms. The original Terrytown theme is entirely replaced with fuller versions until the song is complete, filled with references to the other regions of Hyrule. Category 4 is the variation behavior. It's the vaguest of Gillespie's behaviors because it can apply to everything. Variation means a piece of music has multiple versions that it can swap between, changing tone, instrumentation, or maybe even arrangement, while retaining the core musical information that defines the track. Fire Emblem Fates is the perfect example. It's a strategy game where you command soldiers on the battlefield, and while you're out making strategic choices, the music is soft. When your decisions play out in battle, the music switches to a fuller orchestration with added rhythmic content and increased intensity. Take a listen to how the track Thorn and You changes back and forth during this gameplay clip. Now that we've reviewed different ways game music can behave dynamically, perhaps you're starting to see why turning game music into an album might be difficult. Alternate versions of pieces, extra instruments, and music that replaces other music. It's a non-linear way to experience music. Despite this, official soundtracks have been released before and they attempt to conquer these challenges. Next, let's take a look at some examples of game to album translations. Octopath Traveler features both immediate and game state music behaviors. The character themes represent both states at once. In-game, heroic versions of each character theme seamlessly transition into a battle theme at various points in the story. Now, let's get down to business! I am ready. Since the battle themes appear only once in the soundtrack release, every character theme is rendered as a standalone track, and they never transition into anything. It's a little anticlimactic. Track endings are difficult to figure out in soundtrack releases. Let's go back to Pokemon for this next example. Pokemon Sun and Moon is an astounding 169-piece soundtrack. The order of the album music matches the order of first appearance in the game chronologically. Tracks are reused during gameplay, but not in the album, so sometimes there's severe tonal whiplash when tracks change. For example, track 102, titled Battle, Ultra Beast, is a boss theme, and it plays right before track 103, which is titled Malie City, which is a peaceful town theme. These two songs do not play one after another in the game. The track order in the Sun and Moon music collection is faithful to its presentation in game, but it makes for a jarring listening experience as standalone music, so track order is also important for translation. On to an indie game. A short hike features music with many variations. The sound system is a bit difficult to explain, so bear with me. The player assumes the role of a bird and the music adapts as the bird flies, walks away from a location, and so on. The solution for this album's translation was to split it into two soundtracks, short and long. The short one fades stems in and out so the listener can understand the tone without hearing every stem all the way through. The long version plays the bass music track on loop multiple times within a single audio file, and with each loop, a different variation plays on top, in full. This approach allows the listener more options for how to enjoy the album, but is much more prep work for the artist. 
This album likely required two mixes and masters for each track. Got it! So, when making game music into album music, we have to be careful how we present music with dynamic endings. The music should ideally have a satisfying resolution, be ordered to prevent sudden tonal shifts across pieces, and provide options for the listener while not giving the mastering engineers too much extra work. But a composer might ask, what if I want to present game music more creatively? Covers are a much different approach to soundtrack album creation. Rather than force game audio to conform to linearity, covers allow for a creative reinterpretation that presents game music as a tune in a genre with performance techniques that are naturally linear. Adam Neely's The Nintendofication of Jazz was a big source of inspiration for this research. Through his video, Neely posits that game music is a prime source of material for jazz performance. Charlie Rosen, band leader of the 8-Bit Big Band, makes an appearance and discusses a similar idea. The idea being that like now we're in a generation where video game music has been around long enough that it is itself an equally as important and vast catalog of music that is now set to be able to be reinterpreted. Jazz is an improvisational style, much different than playing strictly notated works. In that way, jazz covers of game music aren't functionally archival because they transform and add much harmonic, melodic, and rhythmic context. But the core identity, the tune, still remains. And applying a jazz structure is a functional way of making game music static instead of dynamic. Jazz isn't the only style that game music works in. In fact, game music has already been adapted into many styles. For example, check out Tig's voice as she sings an operatic metal cover of a World of Warcraft song. Purple Shala does solo piano arrangements of game music, and her music is reminiscent of Romantic era composers like Debussy and Chopin. Such techniques of the Romantic era include wistful chord rolls, pedal usage, and cadences that resolve on tension. Music composers are inspired to write based on music traditions they participated in. If this precedent of musical reinterpretation and synthesis is already established, it makes sense for game music covers to be a vehicle for translating game music into albums. There is, however, a problem with game music covers. Getting permission from the owners of the original music. Who owns game music? Game music ownership is complicated. Often with AAA companies, music composers are outsourced as contract work. Part of the contract a composer must sign will include the company owning the copyright for the music. This is a detriment to the composer because they can't prepare or release the soundtrack on their own if the company doesn't commission them to do it. But from the company's perspective, it gives them tighter control of their IP, and less potential for lawsuits due to licensing issues. Licensing issues are one of the reasons game soundtracks don't get released. Here's a real-life example. Arata Liyoshi is one of the main composers for the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon series. A growing number of fans kept asking him to release the soundtrack for the games he composed for, or to give them permission for fan covers. On his website one day, he made a post saying that he would ask the company he worked for if he could get permission. Liyoshi concluded by saying that neither the fans nor himself had permission. Production time constraints can also cause game soundtracks to be released in poor quality or not at all. Mick Gordon, the composer of the Doom Eternal soundtrack, wrote a long expose with Medium that discussed the poor working conditions during Doom Eternal's development. Id Software announced that a soundtrack release made by Mick Gordon would be bundled with a special edition of Doom Eternal as a pre-purchase bonus with less than two weeks until the pre-purchase became available. Now, unfortunately, Mick Gordon hadn't signed a contract and had learned about the soundtrack release through the pre-purchase announcement. He attempted to make a sound selection of 12 tracks fully mastered, but he was running low on time and upper management had a different person put the full soundtrack together. The final release was a mess. Dynamic music elements like layers and alternate versions of tracks were snapped together without proper tempo syncing or crossfading. The quality and public reception were both poor. Gordon acknowledged that making a game soundtrack release would need to be under a separate contract compared to his work writing music for the game. The whole scenario represents a larger issue. Music teams aren't given enough time or consideration for the effort a soundtrack release takes. Game composers in the AAA scene usually don't own their own music. 
Sometimes, deadlines make it impossible to produce a full soundtrack of high quality. These are two major reasons that game soundtracks don't get released. However, there is still value in pursuing a soundtrack release. It's possible to release game soundtracks despite the challenges of converting non-linear music into linearity. It's also an important task of archival. Game music is a continuation of music tradition, evolving styles and influencing pop culture in various ways. For example, Too Mellow is a game composer and MC who got popular for his original albums and his work on indie games like Celeste and Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. However, Too Mellow didn't always know he wanted to write game music. According to an interview with VentureBeat, Too Mellow made a mashup album of Chrono Trigger and Jay-Z, and that project made him realize that he could write game music from the hip-hop genre. His track, I Wanna Know, in Bomb Rush Cyberfunk blends classic sampling techniques from hip-hop with beat sequencing borrowed from the Almond Break. Another famous composer on the same soundtrack is Hideki Naganuma, who writes with similar sample slicing and fuses it with funk. A good example is his Bomb Rush Cyberfunk track, The People. This soundtrack is culturally significant for the hip-hop fusion genre. Naganuma has already established his style firmly through Jet Set Radio and Lethal League. Too Mellow writes original music in and out of game music. And if the soundtrack of Bomber Cyberfunk never made it beyond the borders of the game, its influence would have been harshly limited. The same goes for all the games cited throughout this video. Have I sold you on creating a soundtrack release yet? As a final recap, to release a game soundtrack, you need to consider what kind of dynamic behavior your music has within the game. Based on that, find a middle ground between how the music sounds in-game and what sounds correct for a linear, music-only format. Covers are a good way to make game music linear, but remember that they're not directly archival, and it's difficult to attain the rights to use your own music once you sign a contract. Carefully plan your soundtrack release ahead of time so you can finish the soundtrack for in-game use and have room to master your music as best you can. Keep these things in mind, and your game music album will be received eagerly by awaiting fans. Thank you for watching! All the sources in this video are also in the description. I'll also attach some extra material if you're interested in learning more about game music. That's all! See ya!